And White House advisor Ivanka Trump post hosted an online event called Find Something New Roundtable. She was accompanied by IBM's executive chairman and the CEO of Apple to talk to Americans who benefited from alternative routes to professional success. Advisor to the President and co-chairman of the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board, Ivanka Trump, hosted the Find Something New virtual roundtable. She was joined by owners of major companies, including Apple CEO Tim Cook. The meeting kicked off the Find Something New ad campaign, which intends to encourage Americans who are unemployed to find something new. This group established a clear set of goals, and foremost among them was the development and creation of a national private sector-led campaign to promote awareness of the multiple pathways to obtain a good job in this country. It's still common for students to go to college after graduating from high school. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, over 65 percent of high school graduates in 2019 enrolled in either a college or university. The trend is primarily due to the idea that attending college is the only way to guarantee that one will make a decent living. But the Trump administration believes that the range of opportunities is a lot wider. Employers and, and job seekers lack sufficient awareness of the multiple career pathways and skill development opportunities available outside of traditional four-year degrees. The White House advisor pointed out that while on average college graduates have higher earnings than high school graduates, high school graduates with below average earnings outperform college graduates with below average earnings. A choking baby was saved by an officer in Sterling Heights, Michigan. The life-saving procedure and the mother's relief were all captured on dash cam video. Time for their approach on me in the driveway. Officer Cameron Machievsky pulled up to a mother in distress and a choking baby. He's still blinking, he's blinking. But the Sterling Heights Police Department officer kept his cool and calmly turned over the toddler to give her the back blows that would save her life. He's crying, he's crying, okay? He's crying, hey, it's okay, he's crying. He's crying, he's crying. Someone in the crowd said the baby was two weeks old. The Sterling Heights Fire Department told Fox 2 that if it wasn't for Officer Mechievsky's quick, calm, life-saving actions, the outcome of the incident could have been tragically different. It's gonna be okay. The baby was taken to the hospital to be evaluated, but police later said that she was in good condition and back with her family. Catastrophic flooding in Michigan and talks in Washington about building a new dam are raising questions. Should there be more dams in the U.S.? NTD's Don Tran spoke with an expert to find out. In the U.S. and around the world, dams have made a home for themselves in many bodies of water. But now there's a growing push to prevent new ones from being built. Sandy Rosenthal, founder of investigative nonprofit Levies.org, says the benefits don't outweigh the consequences. There are just too many options to hydroelectric power these days. And in addition to that, there's also a wealth of knowledge now. Nearly a century's worth of information has shown us that the damage to the environment is, is incredible. In late May, dam failures in Michigan unleashed massive flooding on the Midland community. The flooding carried toxins from a chemical plant into the state's ecosystem. It also forced around 10,000 people to abandon their homes. Rosenthal says the disaster has made Americans more wary of the wide imposing structures. Whenever you see a dam failure in Michigan or a dam failure in Nevada or levee failure in Wisconsin, people think, oh my goodness, um, thank God it wasn't me. Thank God it wasn't my neighborhood. But it always it puts a, it puts a thought into people's minds. You know, this could have been me. This could have could have happened to me. But according to her, floods and natural disasters don't do enough to spread awareness about the issue. She says what really makes a difference is when people speak up. With stories like this one right now, uh, with my organization taking note uh, and working together, that's how change happens. It ha happens either because of a terrible disaster or because the citizens of this country demand it. Rosenthal noted that existing dams should be maintained, but added the U.S. shouldn't build any more. Advocacy organization American Rivers estimates over 1,000 dams were dismantled from 1992 to 2019. Don Tran, NTD News. Beijing said it would impose sanctions on U.S. officials in response to actions taken by the U.S., but experts say the impact will likely be minimal. The U.S. imposed sanctions against top Chinese officials over human rights violations in Xinjiang. 
Beijing announced what it is calling corresponding sanctions against U.S. officials, including two senators, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. It comes in retaliation for sanction measures against Chinese officials that involves freezing their U.S. assets and travel bans. The U.S. imposed sanctions on top Chinese officials for human rights violations targeting minority Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. But experts say Beijing's sanctions on U.S. lawmakers will have little impact. These U.S. lawmakers do not have any assets in China, so the sanction is almost unenforceable against them. Whereas a large portion of Chinese officials' financial assets are based in the U.S. There is a strong desire among Chinese communist officials to use the United States as a place to keep stolen funds, which isn't the case among U.S. lawmakers with China. This results in a severe disparity between the two sides in terms of sanctions. The Chinese Communist Party's treatment of Muslim Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region has drawn international condemnation. More than a million ethnic Uyghurs and Muslims are held in detention centers in Xinjiang. The U.S. sanctions are justified because there is solid evidence that these sanctioned officials are directly responsible for the concentration camps and mass extermination crimes in Xinjiang. But the CCP has no way of using these Americans' concerns about religious freedom and human rights in China to justify its sanctions. Chinese sanctions will also be applied to a U.S. agency that monitors human rights in China. Senator Rubio is co-chairman. Rubio had made light of the sanctions on Twitter, asking, quote, I guess they don't like me. Senator Cruz, also on Twitter, commented that the Chinese regime was, quote, terrified and lashing out. The Chinese Communist Party has no means of sanctioning U.S. officials other than banning them from entering the country. The sanctions come as China-U.S. relations have sunk to new lows amid the CCP virus pandemic. Over to Europe. Former senior UK cabinet minister George Osborne is linked to a powerful pro-China lobby. He praised Huawei generously and was even introduced as the godfather of China-UK relations at the club. NTD UK's Neil Woodrow will bring us more news from Europe. Thanks. Welcome to NTD UK, bringing you UK and European news. Former UK Cabinet Minister George Osborne is the latest figure linked to a powerful pro-China lobby called the 48 Group Club. According to the Times UK, the ex-head of the Treasury was guest of honour at a club banquet in 2017, where he was introduced as the godfather of China-UK relations. His speech praised Huawei and its work on 5G in the UK. While in government in 2013, Osborne visited Huawei's headquarters. He said the West should accept China as a full partner in global free trade. And he oversaw the so-called golden era, during which billions of dollars in deals were signed between the two countries. The 48 Group Club is accused of grooming the UK's elite to promote Beijing's influence. Three founder members have been revealed as secret members of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Staying in UK starting July 24th, shoppers in England will be required to wear face coverings in shops and supermarkets. The new rules are mandatory and will be enforced by the police. Anyone disregarding the rules will be fined up to 125 US dollars. I do think that in shops uh, it is very important to uh, wear a face covering if you're going to be in a, a confined space and, and you want to, to protect other people and to receive protection uh, in turn. The rule is also in place to protect retail workers who face an increased risk of exposure to the CCP virus. The death rate of sales and retail assistance is 75% higher amongst men and 60% higher amongst women than in the general population. Retail staff, children under 11 and people with certain disabilities are exempt from the rule. The government says staff are exempt from mandatory masks since it's not needed in every setting, for example when there's already a protective screen. Moving on, Britain is sending its newly commissioned warship to the Far East. According to the Times UK, the deployment of HMS Queen Elizabeth is aimed at countering Chinese pressure around the South China Sea. At $3.9 billion, the aircraft carrier is expected to conduct military exercises with allies including the United States and Japan. The future flagship can carry up to 40 aircraft and sleep up to 1,600. From ships to airplanes, Virgin Atlantic says it's close to securing a $1.5 billion private rescue deal. Approval would remove the medium-term chance of the carrier becoming insolvent. The British Airlines says it has already secured support from the majority of stakeholders. 
The major new investor is New York-based hedge fund Davidson Kempner Capital Management. The deal comes with a restructuring plan based on a five-year business plan. Virgin Atlantic says it paves the way for the airline to rebuild its balance sheet and return to profitability from 2022. To an air crash investigation. Ukraine's foreign minister says it is too early to blame human error for the downing of a Ukrainian passenger plane in January. Last week, Iran's civil aviation organization said in an interim report that the plane was accidentally downed. But Ukraine's foreign minister says many questions remain unanswered and Ukraine needed authoritative, unbiased, objective answers. Iran's Revolutionary Guard shot down the passenger plane on January 8th, shortly after it took off from Tehran, killing all 176 on board.